You do? Okay. Perfect. There we go. Um, go ahead and start recording so that we can, we'll go ahead and get started and then I'll share this out for the people that weren't able to um, make it to the Zoomie tonight. Um, so it is a few minutes after and this is a ton of information and I have some videos that I want to show. Um, so tonight we are going to talk about um, for our training Zoomy, we're going to talk about the art of doing nothing, um, which is one thing here, but I also want to talk a lot about um, or make sure that we're discussing enrichment um, because enrichment and relaxation, I really think go hand in hand. Um, so let me, hold on. I thought I was going to do this. But... Um, which screen are you seeing right now? <laughs> Seeing your first screen that says training zoomies, the art of doing nothing. Okay. This is not. Oh, there we go. Okay. <laughs> That's all I was trying to do there. Um, okay. So the art of doing nothing. So. Um, for those of you who are just coming into this, um, this is part of the Agape Rescue and Training Center um, or Animal Rescue and Training Center Community Canine Coaching Program. Um, my name is Kim Ifert. I am a certified professional dog trainer, knowledge assessed. I'm the training program coordinator at Agape. Um, I am fear-free certified training professional, uh, licensed family paws educator, um, which is specifically dogs and children. I'm also certified by the Association of Professional Humane Educators. Uh, I'm a mentor trainer for Animal Behavior College, where I got my original certification many years ago. Um, and I have earned my silver certification in Low Stress Handling University, um, which is a great backup to the Fear Free certification because those of us who work in rescue know that Fear Free is fantastic, but sometimes we just have to get the job done. Um, the Low Stress Handling is a great way to do that and still incorporate um, our Fear Free training um, as best we can. As far as the Community Canine Coaching Program, um, it is a project that was started by Agape Animal Rescue a few years ago, and it was formed to be able to offer um, accessible, affordable, and equitable humane uh, behavior and training programs for families in need. Um, we have a number of partners throughout Middle Tennessee um, so that we can support intake prevention in shelters and rescues across Tennessee while increasing the adoptability and quality of life for the dogs who are still awaiting adoption. Um, if anybody has any questions, there is um, a link in the presentation to visit our online resources um, on the agaperescue.org website. There's a whole page of online resources, videos, training practices, and um, a link to sign up for our classes as soon as we have our facility available. Um, so the art of doing nothing is how we wanna make sure that we are bridging the gap between what people want um, and when we talk about what people want, when they go out to adopt a dog or purchase a dog or, you know, whatever their, their practice is, um, they really don't walk into it thinking, I want a dog, or I should say most people um, don't walk into it thinking, I want a dog that I'm going to have to take out on long walks and provide energetic, you know, um, aerobic type exercise on a daily basis and make sure that I have to teach them all these different things. Most people want um, a dog that they can relax with, you know, that's a companion that can sit and chill with them, enjoy the great outdoors once in a while, but also enjoy the great indoors and let us, you know, live our lives. Um, so we are trying to bridge the gap between what people want and um, what dogs need. So dogs need to sniff, to play, to chase, to jump, to dig, to lick, to chew, to shred things, to scavenge. They need to be able to be a dog. Um, so we're trying to figure out, you know, how to, or, you know, working in rescue or um, in shelter life, really our goal is to try and figure out how to make these dogs or make sure that people understand um, what dogs need and make sure that we can provide that, but in a way that suits our lifestyle as well. Um, so, and that's where we start talking about enrichment. So the importance of enrichment is um, almost indescribable. So really we wanna talk about mental activity um, as enrichment because mental activity builds problem solving skills and really builds confidence. So dogs who have experienced um, trauma or loss, just like humans experience trauma or loss, um, very often need to kind of relearn, like your brain rewires itself when you've been through 
an experience. It, it changes how you think, how you react to things. Um, and I don't always want to do that in a way that is physical. Um, although dogs also require physical activity, um, just to stay in good physical health. So our goal in talking about this today is going to be trying to avoid creating what I call a marathon dog. Um, and when I say a marathon dog, it's important to recognize that elite athletes like marathon runners, they don't just start out that first day running 26 miles. Um, they've spent months or even years conditioning their bodies and building their strength and endurance um, to be able to run those long distances. So I've had a lot of people in my um, training career that you know, come in and say, well, I started out and, you know, they told me at the shelter that I just need to get him out for a good walk every day or, you know, to play fetch with him. Um, and I started doing that, but then, you know, I'd take him for a walk and he'd come home tired. And then, you know, after a couple of weeks, I need to take him for a longer walk. And then I need to take him for a longer walk. And then my son started running with him to try and tire him out. Well, what they were kind of inadvertently doing was building this dog's strength and endurance and creating a marathon dog who eventually just needs more and more and more. So, and then when we talk about, um, about living in a shelter life, the other thing that's important is relaxation. Um, you know, we talk a little bit about stress and overstimulation. They can cause all kinds of things and living in a shelter environment or having experienced trauma um, and trauma can be being rehomed, losing your family. Um, it could be a dog who lived outside or didn't have a lot of socialization. It can be all kinds of things. Um, Trauma is whatever the dog thinks trauma is. Um, or in the case of humans, and I'll do a lot of kind of relating back and forth to humans and, and animals, um, you know, a human relates trauma differently as well from person to person. So if we think about something as simple as driving down the road and I, you know, I stop at a stop sign, car rear ends me. So well, that car rear ended me, it might not have done a lot of damage to my car, but oh, the next day I'm so sore. Didn't really require a hospital visit, but I'm sore, I'm stiff. Um, my body felt trauma, but I don't think my brain did. Everything was okay. It's not going to cost me anything. Um, you know, and I didn't have to go to the hospital. So fortunate for me. But the next time I pull up to a stop sign, I start checking my rear view mirror. And it's not because I, you know, I have told myself I did something wrong. I have to check the rear view mirror. But my brain has rewired to say your body was hurt and it was stiff was something that wasn't caused by you, but it could happen again. So your brain rewires. And that's where like living in a shelter or having experienced trauma as an animal, um, whether it be a human animal or a canine or a feline or, you know, horses, cows, whatever. If we've experienced trauma, our brain resets itself um, and starts to work a little bit differently. So Relaxation is one of those ways that we can learn to slow our brain down and let it rewire itself. So we talk about, you know, um, animals and the situations that we're coming from, you know, as the rescue partners here, animals living in foster, animals living in shelter, animals who might need some training, um, animals who have not had all of the things that they might have needed growing up. They may have missed some socialization, but I think it's really important to understand a lot of these things can be turned around. So when I talk about um, uh, stress and overstimulation, it leads to increased anxiety, which can also lead to um, obsessive compulsive behaviors, which might look like uh, tail chasing, shadow chasing, compulsive licking or chewing, um, uh, dogs who have repetitive behaviors, um, spinning or stereotypy or stereotypical behaviors, um, doing the same thing over and over again without any different result is really the um, definition of insanity. So we want to make sure that we're catching those things and we're stopping that brain, slowing it down and letting it reset because these are also the animals that are, you know, if we're working as training, um, or, you know, as a trainer, these are the animals that are more likely to be surrendered to a shelter in the first place. Um, these are the animals that are going to be less likely to be adopted or harder to adopt out because people can't necessarily connect with those animals um, or they look like they have problem behaviors from the get-go. Um, but the other thing is they have these long-term changes in the brain um, if we don't intervene. So it's important to understand the relaxation and how to get them to learn how to do this and self-soothe on their own in these high-stress environments. Um, I do have a... See, I'm gonna switch my share here. 
and show you a little bit about those compulsive behaviors. Well, I'm going to do a whole different screen there. On every vacation at a verbal home, there's someone like you. Sharing my screen again to show you stereotypical behaviors. Let's get out me share. Well, it doesn't look like it wants me to share this other screen here. All right, well, stereotypical behavior kind of walk through and I will share this presentation with each of you as um, I share the link so that we can, oh, so sorry about this. <laughs> okay. Are you seeing the YouTube links here? We are seeing it. Okay, thank you. Let's go back to the one we had before. So this dog spinning and spinning, you'll notice in the kennel, he hits the same wall, the same way wow. every single time. This is a dog who's probably been there for a while and hasn't gotten a lot of mental stimulation. So he's created his own, you know, he's bored. So he's found something to do. Um, but unfortunately it's turned into this pattern and now he has a really hard time being able to break out of that pattern. And that's one of the things, you know, if you don't catch it early on, um, it's something that's very, very hard to turn around. What these dogs really need is to learn how to shut their brain down, how to slow down and stop performing those behaviors. Um, so I'm gonna switch back now to the other screen. So those are like, that's what a stereotypical behavior looks like. And really in real life, if you see it on a regular basis, it's so sad. Um, it is just so hard to see an animal who's going through something yeah. like that. Um, because Kim, isn't it? I mean, it's the shelter environment that's doing that. Very much right? so. Yeah. At, at times it is. It's the, it's really, honestly, it's more of a, um, it, it can be the shelter environment, but it's just constant stimulation. So even if you think about, you know, a super busy household, where things just never slow down, you know, and, and somebody can't take whatever, you know, but the dogs learn to kind of amp up to that lifestyle and yeah. that behavior and their brain starts working on that fast track level yeah. on a regular basis. Um, so it can be, you know, a number of different factors, but I see it more often um, in shelter environments because, you know, it doesn't mean that shelters are bad. Shelters you oh, know, yeah. honestly are fantastic. Totally. Yeah, totally. I, I, I asked that question wrong. Yeah. I, I meant the, the stresses and the anxiety right. you're feeling in the shelter is right. And it's that, that. you know, yeah. I mean, over time, like you think about the shelter environment on a day-to-day -day basis and it turns into, you know, wake up first thing in the morning and there's, you know, spraying the kennels and people going in and out, doors opening and closing, food bowls coming and going, you know, um, uh, wheelie carts with laundry, you know, then the, then the visitors come in and start walking by and other animals are going by. It's just constant, you know, and each time that, that happens, you know, maybe one dog barks and then kind of goes down the chain. So it's a constant environment where they're having to deal with constant stimulus and so that's where I'm saying like their brain starts to kind of get into that mode. Mm -hmm. um, so we want to talk about a couple of types of enrichment to start with. Um, and then we'll move into more of that relaxation stuff. So the first thing I, I always want to talk about is active enrichment, getting outside, being active with your animals. And this is important. We want to make sure that they're getting the physical stimulation that, uh, that they need or the physical exercise that they need. Um, you know, a lot of us, this is why we got a dog. I want a dog to get me out and walking every day and, you know, experience the world and the great outdoors. Um, so there are a lot of things we can do as far as active enrichment, getting up and moving around with your dog that really help to build a positive relationship. Um, you know, and it doesn't have to be with an individual person. It can be with different people. So, you know, if it's in a shelter environment, this is where your volunteers are super important. If you are in a um, foster environment, this is where, you know, having different people in your household work with your animals, um, you know, work with the dogs is a really great opportunity 
to teach these animals who may have not had a great experience before that people can be safe. People can be, um, you know, you can have great positive interactions. And these are things like, you know, going out for a walk, touch massage or grooming. Some dogs love being brushed. And we're going to talk about all these little asterisks in a minute. Um, you know, a good game of, you know, tug or fetch or, um, you know, teaching some hide and seek games, you know, some fun things where we can really get the dogs outside and playing, um, talking to your dog. I've worked with a lot of super shy, fearful dogs. And sometimes just sitting in a quiet room, even if the dog is in the kennel and just reading out loud can make a huge difference using a nice calm tone of voice that not every dog has had the um, pleasant experience of, of having heard a lot before. Um, but just talking to him, letting him get used to um, a different cadence and, you know, a nice, positive, confident um, talking voice. Um, positive reinforcement training is always a great way to bind with the dog. Um, and then relaxation, of course, which we're going to go into specific relaxation later. Um, but when we talk about enrichment, any kind of enrichment, it's really important to remember that if dogs are shy, nervous, um, under socialized or haven't had great experiences, they don't like being touched or brushed or groomed. Um, some of these things are not going to be positive experiences. And just because I want to give a dog a massage doesn't necessarily mean the animal wants a massage. So it's really important to make sure that as we are going through these different things and trying different um, ways to work with our animals and enrich them, that we're really paying attention to their body language and um, yeah. goodness gracious. So sorry. <laughs> shut that one down <laughs> and for entertainment value i just threw in a couple of horses with jolly balls <laughs> um anyway um but it's really important to make sure that we're paying attention and that we're letting the dog decide what is enriching for them what is enjoyable what is pleasant to them um, and that we adjust our activities accordingly um so more passive enrichment, things that we can do without putting a lot of energy and effort into it. Um, again, positive reinforcement training, you know, pull out those treats and start working on things like teaching your dog to go into a crate. You can do that by tossing a treat from three, four five feet away. If you have great aim, you can do it from across the room. Um, you know, but crate training, teaching touch or targeting behaviors are great ways to build confidence in animals. Um, uh, sits and downs, teaching recall training. And I use touch and target for recall training as well. Um, you know, put a leash on them. You can work within your house, sitting on your couch. Um, training games, you know, 101 things to do with a box. Hide and seek games. Hide toys around the house or treats around the house. Teaching fetch and retrieve. In that case, the dog does most of the work and I can kind of sit on the couch and, uh, and just enjoy my afternoon. So passive enrichment is another great way to work with your animal and build confidence. Um, and, you know, work with them on kind of getting their brain to learn different things. Um, meals as enrichment, ditch the food bowl. Um, how amazing that, you know, each of these dogs gets to use their nose, you know, in different things here, you know, this dog is licking and getting some really great things. This is wonderful for bath time or nail trimming or, you know, lots of different things, but you can also put mashed potatoes or cream cheese and, you know, freeze those on the lick mat as well. So get them to lick and sniff and paw and, um, you know, even a little bit of digging in there is great enrichment for dogs. Um, the snuff them out, one of my very favorite things in the world. Again, they get to stick their nose down in there. They can snout, you know, snout out their treats a little bit or their kibble if we're putting their food in there. Um, you know, they can pick it up, shake it, you know, shake all the food out of there, which is what my border collie used to do as a way to uh, let me know that she was smarter than me. <laughs> um, they can paw at the mat. They can kind of dig them out. What I really love about um, snuffle mats is at the end of the day, you can throw it in your washing machine and it's a great way to get it cleaned out as well. Um, on my screen here too, there's um, a Kong wobbler. I really like that for dogs who are eating kibble um, and they can kind of work and push that thing around and use their nose and um, actually move around the room, slows down how they eat so that you're not dealing with dogs who are wolfing down food. Um, we also have puzzle toys and slow feeders in here. So lots of ways that you can actually feed your dog, slow down their meal time if they're a dog who eats really quickly, but also make sure that they're having to work through some of this mental activity, um, use their brain to solve these puzzles to get their everyday meals. 
Um, and then why is this doing this to me? There we go. Um, and there are lots and lots of ways to get creative with this. So if you want to get your kids involved, if you're working in a shelter or um, a rescue and you have volunteers that want to get involved, um, you can find things just in your home, you know, little um, toilet paper rolls or paper towel um, roll holders using those and just folding the end over, putting dry kibble in there. You can decorate them. If you've got kids who are really creative, um, you can punch holes in them. So the dogs and cat and cats, actually, I used to use these a lot with cats. Um, you know, you can roll them around and drop treats out just like you can with an old, you know, inexpensive piece of PVC pipe with some holes drilled into it. These little caps screw onto the end. Again, you can stick it in your dishwasher when you're done. Um, they can nose them around and just roll them around to get the food out. Um, with the toilet paper rolls and over here on the left side of the screen, um, the egg cartons, they can shred those pieces of cardboard if they happen to ingest them. They're digestible, it's not gonna hurt them, but you do kind of wanna watch to make sure that they're being broken into smaller pieces. Um, but putting their food in those is fantastic. Um, something you may already have at home, a muffin tin, go out to Walmart, buy a um, couple of cans of tennis balls for about $6 and you've got one of the greatest toys in the world. Um, you take those little tennis balls, you put your food into each one of the um, muffin holders, the tennis ball on top. And when the dog is done getting all the, you know, figuring out to move those tennis balls, they've got toys all over the floor to play with. Um, flirt pole is another, this little guy here, which looks like a fishing pole. You can just take an old yardstick or um, broomstick, even a pencil. If you've got a cat at home, um, tie, you know, get a string on the end and tie something that your pet loves. You flip it around. It literally is a flick of the wrist. You've got a dog or a cat who can jump, bite, grab, chase, do all those wonderful things without getting your hands and fingers um, or finding inappropriate toys. Um, spray bottles with um, different scents put in them, different essential oils. If you're going to use something like this, again, just let them sniff, you know, find all kinds of things. But if you are going to use these Make sure you check to, to see that the essential oils are safe for your pets. Um, there are some that are actually great for calming. Um, lavender is one. Chamomile is great. Um, cedar is a good one for dogs. Um, there are a couple of others that, you know, are just really fantastic scents that make your home smell good, your shelter smell good, or your rescue smell good. Um, and it gives the dog something different. So this particular um, shelter that I was working with out in California, they had a scent of the day. So every day they would go around and spray the blankets with something different. So that way, if there's one dog who say, doesn't like lavender, um, the next day he gets something different. So um, it's just a great way to, like I said, kind of you know put a good scent out in the air, but give your dogs a different experience on a daily basis. Um, this one with the water bottles, you can recycle those little water bottles at home um, for those people who are still buying them. I've seen these with holes punched in them and a little carabiner um, clipped it to a um, a kennel door so that the dogs get to like kind of knock it around with their nose, but they're not having the opportunity to actually tear the, uh, the bot water bottle apart because we can't always be watching what they're doing in the shelters, but punch a couple of holes in it. Dogs have to knock it around to be able to get their food out. Um, these covered with a sock are a great um, at-home enrichment idea as well. You can put some kibble in it just to keep that scent going. Um, the dog has to get through the sock, but again, we want to make sure that we're not teaching the dog to chew up socks. Um, another one of my big favorites, especially since I've lived in Tennessee for a couple of summers now and realize how hot these summers are, um, get a bowl, put a little bit of olive oil in it, fill it with water, but also add a little bit of chicken stock or um, beef broth, maybe a bouillon cube and put their favorite toys in it and then freeze it, put it outside. And the dog has this great cold, but hydrating way to, you know, lick and chew and dig and paw at to get all of their favorite toys. So again, when they're done with this, they've got that chicken broth or beef broth scent to keep them occupied. But when they're done, They've got all their toys around too. So that's a good long lasting one. Um, you know, another right down here at the bottom um, is just a couple of pieces of a microfiber fleece. There's little blankets that you can make, the no sew blankets, but you get that microfiber fleece, you braid it, um, make sure you've got a good solid knot in the end. And as you braid it, I used to actually put like a few pieces of kibble in, then I tie another knot, then a few more braids, tie another knot. Um, my Rottweiler used to spend hours 
untying the knots to get the food. And then at the end, there was the one knot left and there was no food. So he'd just flip it around and he had his great little, his own little port pole toy um, that he loved just to kind of flip it around and have all these things going. Um, I do recommend though for these and for snuffle mats, if you're making a DIY snuffle mat, that you use um, only microfiber fleece material or like an old t-shirt. We want to make sure when we're making toys that we're not making something that has lots of strings in it. So that if a dog does chew it up, they can end up with strings in their intestines because the whole point to many of these is to keep it as inexpensive as possible. The last thing we want to do is cause um, pain and suffering and surgery. So we want to make sure that we're using safe toys as we go through. And then this last one at the top was just um, a sweet potato that um, we punched a hole in and, you know, cut it into slices, punched holes in them, and then we dried them in the oven for a little while. And then we tied them onto, um, actually, we tied ours onto another braided toy. Um, so the sweet potatoes are nice because they're sort of long lasting when they're um, dried out like that. Most dogs really like it. It's good for their digestive system as long as they don't have allergies. But there are so many ways to create enrichment toys, finding these DIY things, things just in your home. Um, you know, you can really get creative with these. So those are lots of ways that we could work on enrichment, but what we really want to work on today is relaxation. So the first thing we need to do when we're talking about relaxation is make sure that our animals have, um, what they feel is a safe space, a suitable environment and a safe space. So I've got, um, two pictures up here. One is a home environment um, and one is more of a shelter type environment. Um, a couple of things that you know can be challenging if you're working or if you have a home that you have multiple kids and dogs, it's important to make sure that there is at least one area in your home that's a little bit more quiet. Um, some dogs love a kennel, others don't. Um, and you wanna make sure, especially if you have a multi-pet household, that there are areas that are you know a one dog zone. Um, so, you know, if a dog really needs to get away and relax, especially if it's a dog who is a foster or having just come from a shelter, um, newly adopted, we wanna make sure that they have a quiet space that other dogs can't get into, the kids can't get into. Um, you know, think of those old clubhouses where we had the, you know, no boys allowed and no girls allowed. It's because we wanna to tend to kind of decompress and just celebrate on our own. Um, so we wanna make sure the dog has a separate space on its own. Sometimes in a shelter, environment, that can be really hard. You've got multiple dogs, lots of noise. Um, I have found that it's, um, if you have the capability in the space, it can be really, really helpful to put up um, vinyl tarps. They help block some of the noise. I've even used blankets across the top, you know, put a big cardboard or a, um, a piece of vinyl sheeting across the top of a kennel and store your blankets and towels up there. It helps absorb the extra noise in the kennel. Um, we always did that 4th of July. We kind of did that anyway to try and, and block some of the noise of the fireworks. Um, but also you can put another kennel. If you've got a hard sided crate, put that in there. It's one more sound barrier to help give them a place to kind of get away from the noise, but it also gives them that cozy space where they can go in and, and den up if they want to. Um, if you find that they're not that dog, then you can always take it out. But it's a great option for um, a shelter or rescue environment to have a smaller space within the space where they can kind of go away. Um, the other things that I strongly recommend in any of these settings, whether it's a home or a shelter, um, thinking about sound therapy and white noise, whether it's you know the whooshing that you hear when we go to the spa or the music or um, in some cases, quiet thunderstorms, that might be a good way to help desensitize a dog. Um, but again, we want to make sure that we're paying attention um, to how the dogs respond. Um, calming music uh, through a dog's ear is a great um, uh, company that has created, um, you know, done lots of research on creating uh, sounds that are, and actually there's fewer cats here, sounds that are calming to dogs and cats. Um, and they found with dogs that um, a heavy percussion, like a piano music, heavy percussion, but slow, like under the normal dog's heartbeat is actually the most calming sound that we can give for a dog and or cat. Um, and then the last thing I wanna talk about is aromatherapy. So again, bring out those different scents that you can spray in the animal's kennels to help calm them down. Or there's always you know, dog appeasing pheromone. You can buy them in wall diffusers. Um, you can get them in sprays. So if you have a particular animal that may need a little extra, um, you can spray the blankets or bedding or a bandana or collar. Um, there's feel away for cats as well. So um, calming scents can help promote relaxation. 
um, just within the environment without having to do anything extra there. Um, but again, when we're talking about aromatherapy, we wanna make sure that we're talking to a vet and making sure that they're you know, safe for the animals. Um, cats and birds and reptiles can have um, really bad reactions to certain essential oils. So we wanna make sure that we're not causing any harm to anybody. Um, so starting with relaxation, we wanna make sure that we're creating a suitable and safe environment for the animals that we're working with. And then we're gonna go into teaching relaxation. Um, so I have three exercises here that um, I have found to be really helpful. And I've actually found that if I start, if I have, um, if I'm working with a reactive dog, you know, dog reactive, human reactive, you know, reactive to skateboards and all these other, you know, fast moving objects. Um, I found that starting by teaching relaxation before we try and teach any kind of reactive type training, um, you know, look at that or behavior adjustment therapy, any of those if you start with relaxation, it helps to teach the dog how to kind of take a step back. So, um, you know, working as trainers, if you start with relaxation, you're starting at the ground and working your way up. So the first one is something that I have found relatively recently, and it um, was created by Dr. Karen Overall, who was one of the first ones that I was aware of had an actual relaxation protocol. Um, which is a little bit different, but this one is um, a deep breathing exercise. So it's actually teaching your dog to take a deep breath. Um, it can be, and I'm starting with these, the hardest. So this one I found to be the most challenging to teach. Um, but when you do it, think about what do you do to relax? So, you know, if either one of you want to want to pipe up, you know, what's the first thing you do? If you're having a stressful day, what do you do to try and reset your brain? Take a deep breath. Yeah. Take a deep breath. You sit back, stop looking at the computer and a. So our goal is to try and teach our dogs to do the same thing. So, um, and this is a, a protocol where literally you sit in front of your dog. So it's good bonding time. As long as you have a dog who likes that eye contact or close contact. So you want to make sure we're aware of that. Um, so, and you watch their little nostrils and you're looking for the teeniest, tiniest movement of the nostril. So you hold a treat in front. And if you're a clicker trainer, as soon as you see the mouth close and that nostril fairy, you click and treat. So, or you just, yes, and give a treat. So you're looking for that little tiny nostril flare. And then eventually you look for bigger nostril flares and deeper nostril flares before you, you um, reward. So I'm going to, I'm going to try this screen share again. <laughs> Bear with me here. And... It's asking me all kinds of questions about who can share the screen. <laughs> not the one I want to show you yet. Uh, take a breath. All right. Okay. Do you see the dog sitting on the floor? Yes. The little pity guy. Okay. Just slide this over. So I'm not going to play the whole video, but I want you to see take how she does this. It teaches your dog how to hold their breath as a way to learn to deep breathe and focus. This is an exercise that Karen Overall, she's a trainer, um, PhD, who so. helped dogs be able to take a deep breath, much like how humans, when we take a deep breath, they don't they have to always please. physically shake off. They can't. So I am following her instructions. With this. So step mm -hmm. one is teach your dog to take a deep breath. In order to do that, ask your dog to look at you when you have a treat near your eyes. Then when they look at you, Bring the treat down to their nose a few inches without giving it to them. Say breathe and make for them to be relaxed. If they start to get agitated, start <laughs> over. You might have to do a toss off treat and start over because we don't want them to get anxious, agitated, annoyed that they're not getting the treat. So it's going to be here. They look here, bring it to their nose. When you see their nose 
flick, like they're taking a deep breath, that's when you'll say yes and release the treat. Okay. Um, she says to do this for a few times, making sure your dog is comfortable and flaring their nostrils. Um, you can start to close their heart rate and respiratory rate so they can become more focused and relaxed. So you need to only relax, only reward when they're in a focused and relaxed state. Okay. She said it should only take more than, no more than five minutes to teach your dog this. We're not going to do this for five minutes. We're going to do one or two reps. And I'm, so I'm going to see yeah. if I can bring him a little closer. So I'm going to toss him off. And then I'm going to bring his mat over because I think then I'll be able to get him a little closer to the camera. And I want to see if you guys can see his nose flick. All right. So it's that little nostril flare. I'm using stinkies. <laughs> He's a little agitated, so I'm going to toss off again, and we'll start over. It's like, that's a little chompy. <laughs> Three. Yes. And you'll see it right around in here. Did you see that little... He's playing leave it. <laughs> Good boy. <laughs> See that? It's got mm -hmm. the little three. <laughs> I'm not trying to make this frustrating. So if I see he's getting pressure, I'm gonna toss him off and let him have the treat. I'm not gonna reward him for a breathe if he's not giving the breathe. Breathe. Yes. There's so a big one. Foot. He puts so that little heart. Right in here. Yes. You see, I hope you could see these. If not, I'm just looking for a nose flare. Yes, you see how he's air scenting? Mm, what's that? What's that? Breathe. Yes, he took a little flick. <laughs> Toss off. And last one. Breathe. Yes, beautiful. So have fun with this. Teach your dog to take a breath and you can start breathing in sync together. Eventually it'll be when you say breathe, You'll breathe and your dog will breathe. All right. Why do dogs Stop lick their that. paws or eat grass? <laughs> <laughs> Goes right into the next one. Yeah. Um, let me share my other screen again. So what were your, did you notice, did you see that little deep breathing as he was starting? When he did it right, he actually made really good eye contact with her when he did it right. right. Yeah. And I think her timing was off because there were times where I would see it and I think she missed it. I think she was, yeah. you know, focused yeah. so much on talking to the video, which, you know, <laughs> as we can see by how I use the Zoom, that <laughs> yeah. I'll do the same. But um, there were a couple of times where I think she missed it, but eventually you want to get to a point where you can see a bigger movement in that nose flare. And they're actually looking at you and they're focused. And then you start yeah. rewarding for bigger and longer um, inhales. Right. So, and then you know that the exhale is going to follow. So like I said, that one is a little bit harder to teach. So um, that's usually one that I'll give to, I'll work with a client who really, you know, has already been through a couple of others and the dog still needs some work, but I know that the clients are working on it. So um, I just, I find it super interesting that you can actually teach a dog to take a, you know, deep meditative breath because I haven't learned how to do that yet myself. <laughs> <laughs> so that's enough of me sharing. Um, and then the other two relaxation, there are two different uh, relaxation protocols. One is um, by a trainer that I was super fortunate to get to know up in Chicago, um, or she started up in Chicago, Suzanne Clothier, and she has a relaxation protocol. And it's just kind of short sessions of relaxation. Um, and then you just gradually increase the time increments. And this is something that you can do um, on a bed or, um, or, you know, with your dog on a bed or, you know, by teaching your dog to go to a place, it's kind of specified to a specific area. Um, very similar to um, Dr. Overall, who created the Take a Breath, to her relaxation protocol, um, which is a, a building over time. I find that when I try and, and give Dr. Overalls to people, they get very overwhelmed. Um, it's very step-by-step. Step. The protocol, when you look at it, is 15 pages long. Um, and most people aren't even gonna read through it. But if you actually do it, it's much easier. But I am gonna start with um, uh, Suzanne Clothiers. I'm gonna show a quick, I have a short video, um, another trainer up in Chicago 
um, was able to kind of video and get this started. There we go. Share. And I've skipped some of this already. Um, but this is um, uh, Chicago Paws, which is a huge shelter downtown Chicago. Um, they use this relax, protocol relax. with theirs. So you need to well. relax while you're watching the TV, while you're cooking dinner, while you have company over. So relaxation protocol is a great way to teach your dog to do this. Teaching your dog IQ to go to this place and relax. Relaxation protocol is a really easy exercise to teach. Start out by picking a handful of your dog's favorite treats. Long lasting Merrick lamb ones work great. There's our hand. <laughs> I'm gonna stick them right in front of his nose and I'm just gonna lure him onto a bed. And if he knows down, I can lure him into down. Otherwise I can just start dropping the treats in between his front feet. What I want him to start to do is just realize he has to stay there and relax. So I want to start spreading the treats out and say, how long can I wait without giving him a treat before he pops off the bed? Start to teach him treats only come when he's relaxed and on the bed. Signs you want to look for is if the dog is over on a hip or if he puts his head down. Those are all reasons you could drop a treat. Your goal after doing this many times is to be able to get up, start to walk around the room. I usually replace this with a long lasting chew toy at that point. Wait. Keep walking away. Make sure that all of your reinforcers are delivered by you going back to bed. When you're done with the exercise, always release your dog with whatever chew you're using so he knows it's okay to get up. Once you've mastered relaxation protocol, both you and your dog can enjoy some relaxation. <laughs> I love that partly because that dog looks just like my dog, Stanley. <laughs> yeah. um, so I really do like this exercise. And I like that, you know, in a lot of cases we'll teach, you know, go to your place or go to a mat. But in this one, they really talk about, you know, from a, from a shelter or rescue perspective or somebody who's working with a brand new dog who hasn't had the opportunity to learn that skill. You can put them, you know, lure them onto that place and let them relax while they're there by just, um, prolonging the amount of time in between the treats. But as she said, you're also kind of looking for those body language cues that the dog is relaxed, you know, that they're no longer panting heavily, that they're laying on their side, not in that sphinx, like I'm ready to pounce position, um, you know, that they actually put their head down. So those are cues that let me know that the dog is feeling more relaxed. Um, and then the care and overall relaxation protocol, I'm gonna close this one here. Um, the care and overall one, I found this link that actually walks you through all the timing of it. And I'm just gonna play a little bit of the first one. So this is the day one protocol. And as you can see, day one, if you're reading through it, like I said, it's 15 pages long. I give that to most people and they read halfway through the first page and you know, it sits on, you know, goes into a pile, never to be seen again um, until it hits the recycle bin. Um, but I really do like this. And there's a link in the, um, presentation to get to all 15 days of this. So each day it starts out about eight to 10 minutes. Um, and then each day gets a little bit longer. And this is one where you would put a dog on a, you know, on a bed or in a crate. Um, and I just want you to kind of hear like, this is what a typical um, day one relaxation protocol will look like, or will sound like. New relaxation protocol, day one. Sit for two seconds. Time. And then you drop a treat. Sit for five seconds. Time. You drop a treat. Reset. Sit for 10 seconds. Time. Reset. Sit while you take one step back and then return. You realize how long 10 seconds Sit is. Sit <laughs> while you take two steps back and then return. So that is what, you know, part of day one, like I said, just the kind of beginning, but you understand like, it's really not hard 
it just takes understanding what the protocol is and following through. So you do this once or twice a day for 15 days straight. And eventually your dog is going to start getting in this habit of, oh, every time I come over to this spot, this is what I'm supposed to do. Um, but it teaches them in small to five, 10 second increments until you get up to a few minutes. Um, so, and I think the longest one ends up taking a little more than 45 minutes. Um, but that's like after 15 days and you're really setting your dog up for success here. Um, but there is a link to, you know, this video, day one, day two, day three. So you can kind of follow through. So it's a good, easy way to, um, to get your volunteers or your adopters or your fosters to kind of practice with a guide here. Um, and then I'm gonna unshare again, because then we're gonna go into my favorite, favorite exercise. Um, and this honestly is um, something that, not just for shelter dogs, for every dog, I think is so important. Um, when I started teaching obedience classes, group classes, I would start to um, ask them, you know, a week before they started class, I would send home the nothing exercise. Um, and it was created by a kind of controversial trainer. She worked mostly in shelters. Um, her name is Sue Sternberg. And she had this um, train to adopt protocol, but she was also very quick to say that dog should not be living in a shelter. He's mentally suffering and he needs to be euthanized. So she became very controversial, but I do really appreciate that she understood that most people are not going to spend a lot of time and a lot of energy um, teaching their dogs these long drawn out protocols um, that can be a challenge. And that even in a shelter setting, you can do this one and you can start to build. And I started realizing um, again, that this was one of the most important things that you can do if you're working in a shelter setting um, to teach the dogs, you know, give them just, you know, 20 minutes of quiet each day when they're living a life of uncertainty and chaos. And even in the, the best shelters, the most well-run shelters where they can do click for calm every day and keep it quiet, they're still in a strange place and they're still not getting out all the time. And they're still not getting um, the human touch or the enrichment that they need they're still not getting that one-on-one -on -one bond and they're still not having the opportunity to feel the, and I'm going to just show you real quick, the safety and security <laughs> of what it's like to be in a home. Um, <laughs> we do this exercise a lot. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, but this one really just kind of teaches, you know, takes that brain that's used to complete chaos and all day long and teaches it I can't do anything else. Um, so it really is removing the opportunity to do anything, you know, to even become overstimulated in the first place. And then you reinforce calm. So at first I, I hated it because I felt like, oh my gosh, this poor dog just wants to keep moving and doing things. And, um, and I was holding tight onto this leash. And then when I started seeing how it worked over, you know, two or three days and then two or three weeks. And for those few dogs who've been there for, you know, a month or more, um, I really started to see a huge improvement in their behavior. If we did this before we put them back in the kennel, they could go back in with a calm, quiet brain and they could kind of stay that way. Um, so, and the great thing about this is you can do it in any environment. So again, I would have my um, puppy class, you know, st the puppy start, have them start doing the nothing exercise. Um, if I was teaching an older, you know, an adolescent dog class, I would send this home and be like, do this before you even come to class. Because what I wanted was for the dogs to be able to walk into that first class and lay down on the ground and be like, all right, now what? And that changed the whole dynamic of my obedience classes. I also would get feedback from people and I still do, you know, oh my gosh, my dog was, you know, just, you know, dog reactive and kind of crazy. And now I can take him out and we can sit at a dog friendly restaurant. We can sit on the patio and the dog just lays on the ground next to us. So this one, I really love. It's the easiest to teach. Um, and it also, I feel is the one that works the best for them. So we're going to do one more. Oh, nope. Stop my share here and go to the next share. screen. So 
episode. And this is what the nothing exercise actually looks like. So this is a dog that um, was in a shelter and this was this video was taken several years ago, but this is a dog who had not been adopted and was starting to do this stereotypies, this circling and circling and circling in the kennel. The volunteers didn't even want to work with him because he was crazy. He was so hard to control. So they started doing this. This was not his first day doing this. Um, I have worked with dogs where I would hold on to this leash for half an hour before they stopped trying to um, move away or get away. But this one is a quick. So all they did was put a blanket on the floor and notice how she's holding that leash. She's got it super short. She's got her hands tucked between her knees. So if he starts trying to paw at her, if he tries to jump up on her lap, the leash is short enough, he can't jump up in her lap. Um, if he wants to chew on the leash, she's gonna close up her knees so she protects her hands. She can shorten up the leash a little bit and she's just gonna wait for this dog to lay down. She's not touching him. She's not talking to him. She's not trying to tell him what to do. She's letting him think it through, which is a huge part of enrichment. Use your brain. What is it gonna to take to get what you need here? So, and he wants some sort of interaction. Most dogs do. So we just let him think and he's gonna stand there. He's gonna wag his tail. He's gonna to try to paw at her. Um, he's looking at her like, where are the treats? What am I supposed to do? And then eventually he lays down. When he does, and I don't go about it in the same manner, this is actually Sue Sternberg um, doing this exercise. I tend to just like, what a good boy. And then I start to kind of calmly pet him because I don't want him to get all excited. But when he does get excited, when I do pet and let him go back, I'm gonna watch that one again. Um, when I do start to pet him, as soon as he stands up or looks at me or starts to like, oh yes, now you're talking. I stop paying attention. And I wait again. And then eventually he's going to lay back down and then I'm going to pet him again. And as soon as he tries to get up, like, oh, you're petting me. I stop and I wait until he lays back down. Eventually the dog learns, oh, if I want her to pet me, if I want attention, if I want treats, I have to be calm. So most dogs, like I said, will start out you know, five, 10, 15 minutes of just pacing back and forth and chewing on the leash and, you know, whimpering and whining and trying to get up in my lap. And I'm not harming them. I'm not poking them. I'm not prodding them. I'm not doing anything aversive to them. I'm just saying, you know what? If you want my attention, you have to be calm. So this does drive me a little bit crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, but I really do, it's one of the best exercises. And I find that for any dog who has a hard time settling down, if you can teach this as a puppy, and then eventually you can kind of get to the point where um, you can ask the dog, you can put a cue on it. You know, once they lay down and they become- Say more hello to way more quality finds. You'll love forever. There we go. <laughs> um, the YouTube just keeps going. Um, but I find that once they have figured that out, that they lay down and they're calm and they get settled on the side, just like the three dogs here, get a little settled on the side, the head goes down. Then I say, relax, relax. And then I offer a little treat or I pet them. I want them to mimic my behavior. So I'm also, when I'm talking to them and when I'm petting them, I'm going, you're such a good dog you know in a nice calm quiet soothing and when I pet I do kind of a heavy massage type pet I don't do the you know hands all up I think she was using that as an exercise to say when they get up again you stop <laughs> um but I was looking for the shortest video I could find because I knew we'd make it right up until eight o'clock um so anyway I find the nothing exercise to be the most important the most impactful um and the one that seems to be the easiest for um, any average pet owner to be able to perform. Um, just sit with your dog on the leash. They don't get to jump up on the couch. They don't get to jump up in your lap. They don't get to chew on the leash or your shoes or your shoelaces <laughs> um, or any toys. I remove everything. All they have the opportunity to do is lay down and then earn that interaction by just being calm. 
So that is the end of the presentation for tonight. We just want to talk a little bit, you know, in conclusion, um, teaching relaxation, again, helps to bridge that gap between what dogs want and what humans want, or what dogs need, I should say, and what humans want. Um, it helps to, um, to teach both of us, both sides of this equation, um, how to de-stress, um, how to, it can help work on those um, compulsive behaviors. Um, it helps to address the need for constant interaction. Um, for humans, it can help us relieve some of the frustrations and resentment that sometimes come when you have a dog who needs so much engagement and interaction and physical work. Um, it can help to um, decrease the problem behaviors that we have or that we see in the dogs. Um, it can help to um, increase our problem solving abilities when it comes to working with dogs. And it helps to um, make sure that we're, you know, and I'm doing kind of the opposite of everything I have here. You know, the, the gap that we're trying to to bridge is, you know, for dogs who are being surrendered and returned, um, we can, you know, create a, um, a shorter length of stay for those animals that are in those shelters. Um, and we can also make sure that people see this more as um, an empathetic response to some of the challenges that they're dealing with. So um, the goal in all of this, you know, is to be able to bridge that gap between what we're expecting from a dog and what a dog has been through and how we can address that. So, um, and that is the end of the presentation. So any questions? I know I had a lot of back and forth as far as the videos go. What I'll probably do is just send out a link to the direct presentation um, and a recording because the presentation is easier to get through if you can just click that link and go right to that particular video. Um, any questions, thoughts? Outstanding. Yeah. It was really good, Kim. Really like the videos. I thought those were excellent. Thank you. This I'll was do. awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, yeah, certainly. And and hopefully we have the relaxation protocol um, at Crossroads. Um, I don't know that a lot of the interns understood why, you know, and that's, I think that's a big part of this. Um, I actually just went out, we had a dog that, um, or actually somebody who had, um, has a forever foster from Agape right now. And her son went out and adopted a dog who um, had spent, uh, eight months, over eight months in the shelter, um, large breed dog. And the dog that they're trying to introduce is a senior, a much smaller dog. And, you know, they're like, what do we do? He just is so active and he just wants to play all the time. And in just, um, you know, just over a week, they're already seeing a huge difference. And I was like, he needs to teach his brain to slow down. You know, he's, he's used to being in that, you know, that busy, 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 chaotic environment all the time. Um, and he just needs the opportunity to go, you know, so, and trying to teach ourselves how to do that can be a challenge, much less trying to teach an animal that we can't explain to and why this is so important. So were these some of the things you showed them to do, Kim? Yes. Yeah. And this is Charlie. So um, yeah, right. uh, yeah, Trish went out with me. So right. Um, yeah, this was Charlie. We did the nothing exercise. And I was like, whenever you come over, you need to spend the first few minutes just teaching him to do nothing, you know, be relaxed and calm down. And then his whole body started to kind of fall into like, oh, I can do this. And it, you know, it, it, it completely changes their demeanor when you do that. So right. You know, right. fun and activity and exercise is great when we're ready for it but I don't want to have to deal with it when I'm trying to sit down for a nice dinner or right. trying to watch a movie or you right. know, trying to get on a zoom call. <laughs> right. So, yeah. So it's important to teach this and once they yeah. get it, it's a great ex you know, exercise sure. to do an easy one to be able to reinforce. So. Sure. It's really great seeing it happen on the videos to watch it. Yeah. And live. Yeah. And I mean, and then when you, when you see it actually work, you know, and especially the nothing exercise, how easy it is and not saying it's always easy. Sometimes you get that dog who, you know, is really chomping on your hands and you really have to tuck them in between your, you know, in between your knees and hold that leash really short. Um, so like I said, it's, it's not always easy, but it does work. So, and that's, you know, that's the biggest factor. It does work. And if you can work through it, um, and get your dog to understand all I need to do is be calm. 
Mm-hmm. <laughs> you, ha- you have, you know, a dog that's super easy to work with. And like I said, this is a great foundation to lay if you're working with any other kind of um, behavior problems, you know, starting with the basics of let's just slow the brain down. You know, let's get you out of that anxious, compulsive, um, very challenging space. And, you know, most dogs can do it with some relaxation exercise. There are dogs out there that are going to need, you know, medication um, that are going to need a lot more work um, that it's going to take a lot more time with. But the average dog, once they learn this, it's going to be a lifelong skill. Cool. All All right. So I am going to stop the recording somewhere. Yes.